In this video, I will explain how the four Maxwell's equations that describe light can be combined into a single equation. I would recommend you to first watch my other video named Maxwell's equations in tensor notation. First, you should be recognizing these four Maxwell's equations. Let me briefly explain what each equation means. The first equation describes how electric field spreads inward or outward radially, whereas the second equation tells that magnetic fields don't, but rather curls around according to the fourth equation. And the third equation tells how electric field could also curl in the presence of the magnetic field. In order to combine the four equations into a single equation, we have to use other physical quantities than what we have now. At this moment, the four Maxwell's equations are expressed in terms of the field. We are going to use potentials instead. That is the first thing to do, okay? Rewrite the Maxwell's equations in terms of the potentials instead of the field. To do this, we'll have to bring some past definitions. The relationship in between electric field and the scalar potential from electrostatic, and the relationship in between the magnetic field and the vector potential from magnetostatic. Let's review those definitions. In electrostatic, we had the curl of an electric field being equal to zero. When curl of a vector is zero, that vector can be written as a gradient of some scalar. So that was why the electric field in electrostatic was minus gradient of the scalar potential. It's called scalar potential because that potential doesn't have a direction. In magnetostatic, divergence of B was zero. When divergence of a vector is zero, that vector can be written as a curl of another vector. So that's how we introduced a potential that has a direction, and the curl of that vector potential was said to be the magnetic field. All right, let's go back to our topic now. With these definitions, let's try to convert the Maxwell's equations so they are expressed in terms of the potentials. Let's look at the third Maxwell's equation. According to the definition above, we could replace the magnetic field with the curl of the vector potential. The time derivative and the curl are exchangeable, so we could also write it like this. If we move the right term to the other side, we can combine the two curls like this. Yes, that is possible. And now take a moment and look at this. This equation says curl of that whole thing in the bracket should be zero, which also means that expression inside the bracket could be written as a gradient of some scalar potential. So the electric field should have actually had one additional term, but does this mean that this expression was wrong? Not really. You can kind of think of electrostatic case as where the time is stopped. If the time is not flowing, then this term should be zero anyhow. So that is still a valid expression in electrostatic, and we just found a more generic expression. That's all. So let us replace this definition with the more formal definition we just found. Now, what about magnetostatic? This is not something that I learned from somewhere, but as I have studied general relativity, I'm kind of understanding this as a case where the space is stopped. So in electrostatic, time is stopped. In magnetostatic, space is stopped. In our world, it's the time that's flowing and the space is just there. So we can say that our world is kind of magnetostatic. Not exactly, but as you have not learned general relativity yet, you can think like that for now. So we don't need to touch this definition and carry on with it. Alright, back to here. 
Now I have erased the words here. These definitions by themselves represent Maxwell's second and third equations already. Now let's try to plug our new definitions of electric field into Maxwell's first equation. Like this. Divergence of the gradient of a scalar is just Laplacian, the second order derivatives. And again, d over dt and the divergence symbol are exchangeable, so I can say d over dt divergence of a. I'll put a Roman number 1 and leave this expression aside for now. Now, let's look at the fourth Maxwell's equation. Again, I'll replace the magnetic field with the curl of the vector potential and the electric field with this. Here we have curl of curl of A. There is a proven vector identity that talks about curl of curl of a vector. So by rewriting this, we'll have this expression. And after expanding this bracket term, then moving everything except mu j to the left hand side, we can group the four terms here in this way. And I'll assign the Roman number 2 to this equation. Take your time and make sure you're following up till here. Now we have these two Roman numbered equations. Look at the second equation. There is a problem with this term, including this gradient at the front. When we were replacing this electric field from the fourth Maxwell's equation with this new expression, we forgot to consider something. In a real laboratory, we don't directly measure scalar potential. We just can't. What we are measuring is an electric field. Say we are measuring an electric field coming from far away, and from that far away, something changed the scalar potential. This equation means we should know the change instantly. But that is not true according to the Einstein's special relativity. We have to avoid that by not letting the instant change in the scalar potential somehow. We should not let this term survive when we are dealing with the vector potential which obeys spatial relativity. And the solution to that is making the divergence of A, this term, be the opposite of this term, so they cancel each other. This is called the Lorentz gauge. But are we even allowed to do that? Just because we want it? Yes, surprisingly, this gauge does not change or affect any other existing formulas in physics. And apparently, it works out beautifully. Look at this first equation. If I apply Lorentz gauge to this equation, we will have this dv over dt term surviving. But that doesn't matter. All the terms in this equation are scalar quantities. Now let's look at the second equation. If we apply Lorentz gauge to this equation, we can completely erase this first bracket term and just keep the vector potential safely. We now have two new Maxwell's equations in terms of the potentials that satisfy all the field versions of Maxwell's equations. We are almost there. Now, these two expressions already look nice and consistent. How can we combine them into one equation? In our four-dimensional world, any vector could be expressed in something called a four-vector. This is a four-potential vector, and this is four-current vector. This should look familiar if you have watched my previous video. And if you have watched my previous video, you should also be aware of this contravariant and covariant vectors, and how we can turn them into derivatives. Covariant vector is just the first element sign being switched. 
So that's why the second order derivative is a Laplacian minus 1 over c squared d squared over dt squared. Anyway, you study this more in depth in general relativity course. All right, so back to our new Maxwell's equations. I just told you that this part is a Laplacian minus the second order time derivative. Let's first consider the index mu being equal to zero. a to the zero is a v over c, and j to the zero is c rho. If I just move the c to the other side, and knowing the fact that this c square is 1 over epsilon naught mu naught, we obtain this equation. And what is this? This was one of our new Maxwell's equation, which consists of the scalar potential. Now let's look at the case when mu is equal to 1, 2, and 3. These are just x, y, and z components, so I'll just consider them all at once. What do we get? This is precisely our other new Maxwell's equation. This proves that this single equation represents all four Maxwell's equations. And in fact, this describes everything about electromagnetic field, light. Let there be light. Let there be light. Let there be light.